everyone, my name is Samantha Cal, and today I'm going to be talking about the RNA pseudonaut and an investigation of its pointing and mispointing to massively molecular paradynamics. <laughs> but first of all, what is RNA folding? And how does it differ from protein folding? Well, as we all know, RNA is made up of four different nucleotides, such as adenine, uracil, thiamine, and guanine, while proteins are made of 20 different amino acids, such as arginine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. We also know that the RNA side chains are all neutral and hydrophobic. By our protein side chains, the, it could be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, polar, non polar, or depending on their R groups. Because RNA does contain phosphates, they do need counter ions to neutralize this, while most proteins are at a net near neutral charge with the charges being further apart. And most interestingly, we see that most of the RNA base pairing are, all, are actually non Watson quick, which means that the RNA structures can be hairpin, bulges, loops, or as I'm studying today, pseudonaut. But what is an RNA pseudonaut? Well, if you're given a single RNA strand and you're looking at two different sets of dinucleotides, and there's going to be an inversion between these sets, it's going to fold upon itself, forming a someone, where the, um, the red dashes actually mean hydrogen bonding. If within that same RNA sequence, you have another inversion occurring between, so if it's upon itself again, you have your SEM1 and your SEM2. So basically, an RNA pseudonaut is when you have two stem loop structures. So here's your stem and then those are your loops. So the figure on the left is actually just a one-dimensional structure. Um, a pseudonaut is actually has tertiary-like twist because it falls upon itself, so it's sort of like a DNA twist. And so, this is basically your RNA pseudonaut. But why should we study RNA pseudonauts? They do have biological functions, such as they help regulate translation, participate in viral replication, and they cause frame shifting during protein synthesis. And as we all know, frame shifting is when you have an insertion or deletion in, of a nucleotide. And because RNA does help with protein synthesis, if you do have an insertion or deletion, it just creates mutations in your body. Pseudonauts can also be found in the catalytic core ribozymes, so they do play a role in the active site. And by studying the folding and unfolding of RNA pseudonauts, we can apply this model to larger RNA models in all atom detail. And because pseudonauts are ranging from 26 to 32 residues, they are also computationally accessible. The pseudonaut that I'm studying today is from the poliovirus pseudonaut, also known as the potato leaf roll virus, from the family Luteoviridae. It has 26 residues as indicated in this figure, and as I mentioned before, a pseudonaut has two stem loop structures. So here's your stem and there's your loops. And it has a tertiary-like twist, like I mentioned before with like, DNA, and if a plant is infected with the potato leaf row virus, the leaves are actually brown or purple and the leaves will curl inwards. So my research was all in dynamics, and we used the Gromax ND suite with the Amber 94 Atom Force Field within a 75 inch cubic box with periodic binding conditions and approximately 13,500 tip 3 water molecules. We neutralized our phosphates with 25 sodium ions with a molarity of 100 micromolar and we had a 2.0 femtosecond time step under NPT conditions. As I showed in this video, the red, sorry, the red, the blue balls represent the sodium ions and this is the folding and unfolding of our pseudonaut. So in order to calculate our data, or actually collect it, we use something called Folding at Home. And Folding at Home is actually the world's largest distributed supercomputer. It has 5.5 million CPUs and 330,000 active processors. It's actually now preloaded on the PS3, and <laughs> we were able um, to have 200 simulations for each 45 start, from each 45 starting states, for the total of 9,000 simulations, and a total simulation time of 230 microseconds. So basically, folding at home, if you are a registered user, if your computer is not being in use, or if it's not in screensaver mode, your computer is crunching these numbers for us. And once those numbers are done and the job is done, that data gets sent back to our servers, and that's how we collect our data. And so we have our data, and we want to analyze the free energy landscape. So we did something called the pathway enumeration sampling. And by using the pathway enumeration sampling, we're able to calculate the 40 kinetics and mechanism. So we have our pseudonaut, and what we did was we had 
20 thermal and 40 simulations. So we increase the temperature of the not for it to unfold. And then once that, which is shown in figure A, and once that occurred, we had a rapid annealing process in order to analyze the free energy surface. And once our ensemble has reached equilibrium, we analyze the transitions between these microstates, as indicated in the red arrow in figure C. We also, um, once we have our structures, we actually characterize them, then characterize them by the root mean square deviation, RMSD, radius of gyration, hydrogen bonds, base pairing, and the formation of native and non-native contacts. We defined a native contact as if the, if the state or the conformation has a RMSD less than 3.5 angstroms, and between, we looked at atom pairs of, any, atom pairs of the nucleides greater than four, and see if they're less than four angstroms apart, and that these interactions have to occur at least 25% within the, all the simulations. We also run a K-means clustering algorithm to determine um, different conformational microstates, which we found 27, where we call them clusters, where cluster zero is the most populated and cluster 26 is the least populated. And as shown in the figure to the left, we establish our equilibrium at 6.0 nanoseconds. We also formed the microstate schematic, where within our 27 clusters, where M0 through M4 represents the fluctuations about the native folded structure. M5 to M15 represent the fluctuations of various intermediates and kinetic traps, where a kinetic trap is when you have your microstate, in order to transition into another microstate, it has to overcome a huge energy barrier. And where M16 to M26 represent the fluctuations of possible non-native unfolded conformation of microstates. Between these clusters, we have these transition arrows with different colors to represent the time step, for that type of time to, for its transition. Where red represents the faster transitions, while green represents the slower transitions. And the red, black, blue, and green are all by different orders of 10. We then took a data to form a free energy landscape to understand the folding mechanism from, um, with, 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 with our native contacts. So here we have our x-axis, well sorry, our y-axis of native contacts in percent and all atom RMSD and non-native contacts. Where F1 and F2 represent the most native structure. F1 represents the native, the most native contacts, or F2 represents mostly native contacts. Here, our U represents our unfolded, so it has a very low percentage of native contacts and larger RMSD. We found two different intermediate macrostates where, again, I2 represents a higher percentage of native contacts, and I1 represents a lower, lower percentage. <coughs> and we found four different misfolded macrostates. Right, M2 and M4 represent a higher percentage of these native contacts, so M1 and M3 represent a lower percentage. So we wanted to see the folding pathway within our unfolded, folded, and misfolded intermediates. So we found that we had four misfolded macrostates, and within our unfolded state, we saw that it actually transitioned between one of the intermediates. We also saw that for one of the misfolded states, it's also an equilibrium transition between the two intermediates. And for each box, these transitions are occurring in fast equilibrium, but then for, from, use, from the unfolded to intermediate one, it's actually occurring on a slower transition. So now that we have this information, we want to find out, do, us, do our pseudonauts compare to other pseudonauts in a similar fashion of folding and unfolding? And how, if we have a different sequence of RNA, how does that play a role? And then to, how do, how do ions um, affect the folding and unfolding? So as I mentioned before, we use sodium ions to neutralize our box with the phosphate groups. So I want to see if we have a different concentration, how much effect would that have, as well as the Roll of water and so not folding, a folding and misfolding, and how can we engineer these sequences to fold along a desired rate or at a desired route to get from one state to another? And I couldn't do my research without the road ride folding at home volunteers to contribute their invaluable processor time, and the CERN research lab at Cal State Long Beach, as well as funding through Women in Philanthropy, Kenneth and Marcy, and James L. Jensen. And that is all. <laughs> Yes. 
So you talk about like the kinetic traps when they're folding. Are they like self-catalytic molecules to overcome the traps if they fold in the correct state, or is it kind of just like a statistical chance that they will make a pass? I'm sorry, I can't really. So they they're <coughs> encountering like the kinetic traps you said right? yes. when they're folding. Yes. Are they self-catalytic if they fold correctly, like to overcome the energy barrier? Or is it kind of just like a chance? I think it's, it's both like a chance to see. It's just, we can't really predict how they fold. It's just whatever they fall upon if they're able to overcome that barrier by itself or not. Uh, great talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned that you have this distributed computing mm -hmm. approach. So essentially, you have a lot of independent simulations. But then you study the kinetics. So I missed one point of how you connect your distributed computing with the kinetic information that is instead more continuous type of information, right? Um, like, can you explain essentially how you move, how you interpret your distributed data into a kinetic? Oh, I see. OK. So in order to run simulations, we don't have enough computing power on campus. So we use 40 at home, and so it's like, okay, here's here's our molecule, here's the parameters, here's what we need. Um, go, <laughs> take our numbers and crunch up those numbers. And then once we get that a huge data log file back, that's what we use to analyze. We run Python and Perl scripts to analyze our data to get. Yeah, the my, my question was but more on the on the theory behind it. So I imagine mm -hmm. if you have all this independent simulation. In each of them, you will have these transitions, but you are actually analyzing them the entire data all together. Yes. So how do you know uh, what happens in each of your independent runs on which time scales, for example? That is a good question. I do not know how to answer that. <laughs> because I could imagine you, you would be able to observe this if you had a very, very long individual simulation. Yeah. But you but we have many your, different yeah. simulations, yeah. Um, I actually didn't write the script for that one, so I don't know how they, they took it all together. Thank you. Okay. Can you run your simulations in the presence of dimulant cations, like magnesium? Or have you done it? We <laughs> cannot run our simulations with magnesium. With, we can't run it with hard molecules because it's kind of hard to simulate. So, so that's just a limitation of that yeah, we have basis set. Yeah. Yes. So the, on the bottom question, did, we, did you analyze the effects of the environment that you did have on the uh, protein ions? Did you analyze the... You had, you had water and sodium ions there. Yes. Right, so did you, quanti did you investigate how those were influencing the protein ions? And or were you focused on the RNA? We were focusing more on the RNA. We didn't focus on the effect of the concentration yet. That's our next Another, another short question. Uh, I find this extremely interesting. Uh, do, do you have in mind any way to validate experimentally your Yes, we do. We're actually doing that right now. We're trying to look at other student with a similar number of nucleotides and see how many states they have, as well as the difference in sequences. There are actually many student right now that, are being, that have been studied experimentally. We're trying to compare our data with their data. But the thing that it's kind of hard is that um, most of them they don't do the potato they throw up. They do that they do it or not. But yeah, there are experimental data on this. All right, thank you. Okay.